Good morning, and welcome to First Congregational Church of Chickabee. Our pastor, the Reverend Gary Gott Grimes, is away on a very well-deserved vacation. And we will be having the pleasure of worshiping with the Reverend Robert Livingston today for Sunday service. We have a few announcements today. I'd like to remind everyone that today is our annual break and bread, which is every first and third Sunday of the month. It's today from 5 to 6.30 here at the church. It's curbside pickup. We will provide a hot meal and a sandwich as well today, as long as, along with a dessert. This is a community meal. Everyone is welcome here. We are located on 306 Chickabee Street, in case you were wondering. Also today, like every other Sunday, from 5.30 to 6, from 5 to 6.30, Regina's Food Pantry will be open. If you are in need of pantry items or know someone who is, we'll be here from 5 to 6.30 here at the church. If you cannot make that time, you may call the church office at 592-0396 and we can make arrangements. Also a reminder to mark your calendar, the All Church Retreat in Craigville is coming up fast approaching on September 3rd to the 5th. So please mark your calendar. The other thing I want to remind everybody who are here and who are watches, watching us live that we are now back in person church every Sunday here at the church at 10 a.m. In case you forgot where we are, we are here at 306 Chickabee Street in Chickabee. We look forward to seeing you all and worshiping in community with each other. We are practicing social distancing. We have our pews marked off, every other pew, and you are required to wear a mask. So please, if you are able to join us, it would be great. Let us now leave everything that burdens us throughout the week behind, and let us prepare to worship God together.
join together in our prayer of confession. God, we confess our faults, we confess ourselves and our ideas that do not provide us with the energy we need to do your work. This creates space between you and us, between ourselves and each other, as members of Christ's one body. Oftentimes, we are willing to risk our sustained health and well-being for immediate satisfaction. Friends, Christ always waits for us here at the table, breaking bread, the bread of life, holding forgiveness ready when we are ready and when we ask. Indeed, my friends, we are a forgiven people. Thanks be to God. Let us pray as Christ has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Dear Jesus, be with me. Be with me. Fill me and nourish me. Be part of me. Be part of me. Help me with everything I need. Take care of me. Amen. Amen. As we uh, come to our time of prayer, I just remember that within our tradition, we believe that when we are a gathered people, that's when the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, seems to be most present to us. So, with that in mind, let us open ourselves to God's being here, with us, in us, through us. First of all, uh, do we have any concerns or joys to be shared in our prayer time? Yes. I like uh, prayers for the um, outbreak of the Delta variant in our community. Um, and all those who are affected. And please give us wisdom uh, going forward to try to uh, stop this COVID outbreak. Thank you. Others, yes. I'm joyful that, first of all, the first dough turned out well last night, and that today's dough turned out well last night, and that I learned something while trying to get ready for today's Sunday school lesson. A little louder, she says. Okay, <laughs> I will try. I use my preacher voice. How's that? All right. Uh, others, I don't want to miss anybody. Then let us join in prayer. Creating, sustaining, still speaking, God. We bring our lives to you in our worship. We return here week after week to understand ourselves, to experience strength in the company of others searching for your truth. We thank you for each other, and we praise you for the worldwide community of faith, the church. Within the church, we're fed spiritually that we might show you in the way we live our lives, here we feel a trust, a unified purpose through which our faith in others can be restored. When we leave here to go out into the world again, fill us with such a prodding spirit of yours to prevent us from confirming the world's mold. Help us when your call compels us to be different. Let us witness for you with the lives of compassion, love, and a value that puts faithfulness in you above all else. We confess that we fail to live fully. We get bogged down trying to compete in a suspicious world. We leave little time for communication with you to have our spirits nourished and strengthened. In our self-centeredness, we ignore the issues of life that you have called us to bring your love. We find ourselves hungry at the banquet of your life, your love. Forgive us, O oh God, and bring us to the mind of Christ that we might live in his example. We lift before you those who are in special need. We pray for your healing presence. We think of those who are ill not only of body, but also of mind and spirit who need your compassion. Help us to be vessels of compassion as you accept our prayers on their behalf. We remember the hungry and the homeless, the frightened and the friendless, those who suffer from human cruelty and aggression and oppression. Those whose bodies are so weakened by the lack of nourishment that spiritual food is not even a possibility. May our prayers incite our imaginations to move into action as we respond to your call to us 
to be just servants in the model of Christ. Feed us with the bread of life, that we may be strengthened to touch the lives of others with your love and your grace. And now once again we open ourselves to the reality of your presence, bringing to you our silent prayers of thanksgiving for our blessings, as well as our personal prayers on behalf of others. Today, we remember those who, whose lives have been shattered by fire, flood, drought, and other forces of nature. For our brothers and sisters in Syria, and Afghanistan, Israel, Palestine, and others, who are also victims of war and injustice. We remember before you, God, the First Nation people who are reburying their children who died in forced boarding schools. For the victims of hatred and violence, for those in the Middle East and those who experience violence in our streets. For those who suffer from the COVID-19 and those who have their own reasons not to take precautions. God grant us wisdom and compassion. We also pray for increased wisdom and care for God's beloved earth, for migrants seeking safety and justice. And now, in a moment of silence, we bring our personal prayers to you, our God. We bring to your loving presence, Paul Calvin, as he will undergo cardiac procedure this coming week. We remember Derek Faber as he leaves this week to go into the Air Force. We pray also with joy for those who will be having birthdays this week. Chris, and Sheila, Lori, Glenn, and Nathan. Oh God, we're in the middle of the summer months. We look forward to rest and recreation, but time is moving rapidly on and we find ourselves stressed and weary, especially as the Delta, Delta virus moves through our country. God, we need to slow down. We, we know this, but we find it hard to do. We load ourselves up with activities and stresses and duties and then wonder how we're going to survive them. As you have found us before, find us again. Wrap the arms of compassion around us. Help us to savor the times we have with each other. Make us keenly aware of the magnificence of this world draw us to times of peace and rest. As we have brought the names of loved ones for your healing mercies, remind us, too, that we stand in need of your healing love. Give us strength, courage, and joy that we might be become disciples who are worthy of your realm. For we offer this prayer in the name and spirit of Jesus, the Christ, whose way we have promised to follow. Amen. Amen. We pray with joy for birthday celebrations. So, Aaron, would you like to help us sing a happy birthday to those folks? Uh... 
covered the camp. In the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. Our second scripture reading of the morning is portions of Psalm 78. Yet he commanded the skies above and opened the doors of heaven. He rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. Mortals ate of the bread of angels. He sent them food in abundance. He caused the east wind to blow in the heavens and by his power he led the south wind. He rained flesh upon them like dust, winged birds like the sand of the seas. He let them fall within their camp, all around their dwellings, and they ate and were well filled, for he gave them what they craved. Inviting me 
I told Gary that I would follow up really badly, so he would be glad to have you back. <laughs> now, I also have to tell you that uh, I was asked before the service by a couple people, and some of you may be wondering, I, for many years, have had my ministry dog with me, Daisy, and uh, back in June, she succumbed to leukemia. And we lost her, and it's a, it's a tough one. It really is a tough one, but we know what life is like, and we know what death is like, and we, we still trust in God through all of that. On April 6th, in 1932, you're sneaking up on me, Bob. What are you doing? <laughs> I, I'm afraid I'm going to eat the thing. Okay, starting again. <laughs> in April 6th of 1932, at the uh, DuPont Laboratory in Deepwater, New Jersey, a man named Roy Plunkett set to work on his first assignment for the company. He was working on refrigerated gases. And one of those gases was Freon, irregularly used in, in refrigerators. Now Plunkett and his assistant were testing the gas under various conditions when they made a mistake in their procedure. Consequently, when they opened a cylinder of the gas, it didn't spurt out, it didn't discharge as they expected. They set that cylinder aside, and later, Plunkett thought to himself that the cylinder seemed heavier than it should be, and he wondered if it was going to explode. And ignoring the caution and taking the chance, he opened it and discovered some solid white substance inside. What could this be? The more that Plunkett tested that substance, he was surprised by, by its properties. It, it didn't seem to react with other chemicals. It retained its properties, whether 500 degrees below zero or 400 above. Vacuum had no effect on it, which meant it would be perfect, he realized, to use in an outer space environment. It also refused to stick to anything. It was polytetrafluoroethylene. That's known as Teflon, and that's a lot easier to say. Since its discovery, every two and a half billion pounds of that stuff has been <laughs> sold. It's been used, believe it or not, to keep the Statue of Liberty from rusting. It's a cardiac medicine to coat wires in light bulbs, of course, in the pots and pans that used because of their non-stick qualities. Well, Plunkett later admitted that he'd just been plain lucky, that the stuff should have exploded with a disastrous effect, but looking for one thing, he discovered something else, something much better. Well, even though today we have some doubts about the health risks of Teflon, especially in cooking pots and pans, it was a miraculous substance. The Gospel of John tells us that people were looking at Jesus for one thing, but they found another. The crowd that followed him was because he'd fed them. And as Gary said last Sunday, this miracle of the feeding of the multitudes, this act of compassion was called a sign, a sign by the writer of John. Like a road sign, and like all the signs of the gospel in John, it pointed straight toward Jesus. Jesus was, 
and is more amazing than the appearance of bread. But the people lost sight of everything except the food. Their search had led them to the bread of life, but although they appreciated it first as an unexpected discovery, they weren't at all interested in the second one. We can understand the attraction of bread. Bread is essential in every culture. Our problem in the overdeveloped world is it tends that we get we tend to get too much to eat. For most people in the world, most of the time, the problem, of course, is having too little. And bread is more than nutrition. You know that. It's really, it's comfort. The texture, the weight, the taste, bread, however you slice it, makes a perfect bed for butter or honey or jam or all three. It's the bed for the rest of them. All combined to make bread both the staff and the comfort of life. The conservationist, John Muir, made it clear how essential bread is to, to our well-being in his his book entitled My First Summer in the Sierra, which tells the story of how he accompanied a shepherd and a flock of sheep in the summer of 1869 to earn a bit of extra money. The sheep were led up high into the mountains to escape the brutal heat of the Central Valley in California. In the book, he writes rather rapturously and about the wonders that he finds in Yosemite and in the Yosemite Valley, and he draws pictures of trees and, and flowers and mountains. He describes them in great detail until the two men run out of flour to make bread. Even though there's plenty of mutton to eat, Muir becomes blind to the beauty all around him and at one point he writes, the bread famine is sore. He adds, the stomach begins to assert itself in an independent creature with a will of its own. And finally he writes, rather than weak and sickish this morning, all I wanted was a piece of bread. That affliction was cured only when the supplies made their way up the mountain and the flour for baking was restored. So, when those who followed Jesus found him, they can be excused, I suppose, for wanting more of that bread. Life is tough without it. Even worse, the bread distracted them from seeing Jesus, the one sent by God. Since free bread and circuses were the hallmark of the emperors, the people were beginning to think of the giver of this bread as a king. The hunt for a king is something possibly even we could appreciate. Though we elect representatives to various branches of government, it seems as if deep down inside people want someone who is going to provide everything for them. After the United States adopted its new constitution, many people thought they were selecting not a president, but a monarch. Many expected that George Washington would rule until his death, and they assumed that he would act like a king. Part of the genius of Washington was that he had no intention of doing any such thing. He had to be convinced to run for a second term. And then when that term was over, he made a point of stepping down so that the world would not see someone who was president for life. 
would not set a precedent for dying in office. And curiously, that was Washington's intention all along. And he became the target of criticism because of it. And when Jesus challenged the people to see him as something more than an earthly king, the people turned against him. In today's Gospel reading, the people expected Jesus to be a king, a messiah, who would drive the, the Romans away and set up a perfect worldly government that they thought had been promised forever in the scripture. So the task of Jesus in confronting the people was to let them know he had no intention of being their baker or their king at least as they understood it. Well, if they couldn't have a king, at least it's clear that they wanted more bread. They even demanded it. They asked for a sign, but one of their ancestors had received the bread. Out there in the desert, remember the story? Man, bread every day, Bread from heaven? Well, manna in Hebrew means, what is it? And the people essentially asked Jesus, not just what is it, but where is it? Referring to that free bread. And Jesus, the living bread, standing in their midst, knew the crowd would not be satisfied with his answer. Now, we can sense that this is not going to end well. Perhaps they've forgotten that the manna given to the people when they wandered for 40 years in the wilderness stopped once they crossed the Jordan into their inheritance. Part of their inheritance was freedom to work, the joy of labor, and the satisfaction of accomplishment. But those who had originally come to hear Jesus forgot his words after being distracted by the food. They were content to wander in the desert of sin instead of entering into the promised land of grace. So, what can we learn from this? Are we more interested in what we can get from God instead of remaining intent on worshiping God and serving God's humanity? Are we distracted by ritual, by symbols, by the process? And then we forget the reality of Jesus and his teachings that lie behind all of that. Does discipleship get lost because we're so intent that we're looking at Jesus that we forget what he taught? Remember this. Jesus never asked us to worship him. Jesus asked us to follow him. The biggest lesson is that it doesn't work for us to put Jesus into a convenient box and pull him out whenever we feel like it so he can do what we want, to stand up for our way of life, you know, national, Christian nationalism, so-called, to perform on our command, and then we put him back in the box before his demands is his expectations, the gospel get in our way. We say we want to be saved, but do we have any idea of what it means to be saved? Saved from what? Saved for what? What do we want to be changed into? Are we ready? Are we ready to be transformed? Well, friends, the bread of heaven is still before us. 
but we don't control the, the living bread. We're servants of God, not dispatch agents. By pointing out that their ancestors ate manna in the desert, perhaps these people thought that they could turn the blessings of God on and off whenever they wanted. True discipleship, though, true discipleship begins in recognizing who is in charge. Jesus is all we think he is, and a lot more, and the things will work a whole lot better when we start thinking about ourselves a whole lot less. What is it? What could it be? It's not Teflon. No. It's the Christ of God, the living bread. And the living bread is right here. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for the gift of the scriptures that show us the abundant love you have for us from the beginning. Thank you for the witness of the gospel writers who show us Jesus and his way. Thank you for the Apostle Paul whose prayers for the church echo through our own churches today. Fill us with your fullness, God, that we may be your faithful and generous service, servants in this world. Amen. As we come to the the time of the offering, friends, I remind you that rather than receiving the offering up front, there are plates uh, after the last pew, and you're invited to put your offering in, in those plates. Let us join the offertory this morning.
Please join me now in the prayer of dedication. O oh God, we share these gifts in the spirit of those who share their loaves and fishes. Use these gifts and use us to feed all creation, to produce seeds and grain, to meet human needs, and to restore wholeness in places where physical and spiritual malnourishment exists. Amen. Our communion hymn is Break Thou the Bread of Life, number 413.
Let us join in our prayer of giving thanks to God for the blessings of this simple but very profound meaning. Still speaking, God, God, you have called your people from, from east and west and north and south to the feast at the table of Jesus Christ. We thank you for Christ's presence and for the spiritual food of Christ's body and blood. By the power of your Holy Spirit, keep us up to your will. Go with us to the streets, to our homes, to our places of labor and leisure, that whether we are gathered or scattered, we may be the servant church of the servant Christ, in whose name we rejoice to pray. Amen. The hymn is printed in your bulletin is incorrect. Please go to number 750-750, Peace Like a River.